I'll do. Literally, give me two minutes of your time, then I'm out with a boy in the snow, vlogging, probably, or hopefully, a real insight into Charles Salvador's, also known as Charles Bronson's, public parole hearing. Yeah? So, observations from my friend. He's rocking. I don't mean rocking to music, I mean rocking in a bad way. Showing signs of anxiety. Yeah? He's tapping. Deep breathing, or she believes deep breathing exercises, trying to manage anxiety. It's his parole hearing. He's been inside almost 50 years. This is his chance of freedom. There's 10 people in a small room, some on laptops. Yeah, it's his chance to freedom. Displaying all the signs of trauma, PTSD, complex PTSD. Yeah. And here's a little bit I forgot in the vlog. I believe it was probation. Yeah. If Claw come into context, when you follow the vlog, put to him, he has a little tipple, Charlie, a little bet, a little gamble. Now, no gambling or playing cards or whatever, you know, was not allowed in prison anyway. However, he's been having a tipple, yeah? So they put to him, he's a gambler and he's breaking prison rules because apparently in 2020, there was a new prison rule, yeah? And they're putting that to him because he's a bad man who's been gambling, yeah? That has been breaking this rule. So he says, I've been inside 40, 50 years there or thereabouts. If a new rule comes out and I'm allowed to carry on doing something and don't know about that rule, how can you hold me in account? He turned to a prison officer because there's prison officers in this room, obviously, and said, did you know about that rule? The prison officer said, no, Charlie. Yeah. Into the vlog. I'll do. How we doing, Stephen? Come on then, kidder. Here we go. Come on, lad. No mic today, guys. I think my mic's given up the ghost, but as a Yorkshireman, having spent 12 quid, and it's done me two years of vlogging, then I can't complain, can I? What we're saying, lad? Eh? Can we complain? No, we can't. So, today's vlog, guys. Charlie. So, a very good friend of mine. I'll give you some context after I've thanked everyone. Thanks for the continuous support, positive comments, um, and support for guests especially. I really appreciate that. I will have a little um, Mental Health Monday this week. Tomorrow night, Sunday night, uh, I'll be interviewing a lovely lady. Uh, manic depression. Bipolar as it's now called. Prison, forensic units and the like. Yeah, but today we're going to talk about Charlie Bronson. I'm not rehashing old content. So let me give some context. Very good friend of mine applied and attended Charlie's parole hearing. I had no idea uh, how she went about that. So those of you who don't know, Charlie's parole hearing. Last Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Friday was private. Yeah, not for public. She attended Monday and Wednesday. Um, I'll give you a bit of context on this lovely lady first. Um, she suffered childhood trauma of the worst kind. She was raped and abused as a kid by her own father. To further add to her trauma as a young child, she was introduced to Cromwell Street and Fred and Rosemary West. Those that don't know who Fred and Rosemary West are horrendous serial killers. You know, rape her raping, torching kids, uh, including their own kids, pimping kids out and the like. So she has come from a trauma background. Um, she's a young lady, we never discussed lady's age. She is however deaf and has two hearing aids. So she has got golden ticket as it were for her. The reason she wanted to attend Charlie's parole hearing. She read an article on him and she was intrigued like a lot of people are she looked into it more and she eventually started writing to him this isn't some young schoolgirl all starry eyed she made it quite clear from the start to charlie uh his story had interest her she told him a little bit about her background told him you know there was no no marriage proposals or anything like that on the card she is an amazing human being and she doesn't like injustice. 
hence why she started writing so the parole hearing let me set the scene first guys amazing up here today beautiful crisp and clear like i said no mic so i hope this comes across and you can hear what i'm saying she entered a court so she went in a court charlie is in prison it's a video link to the court so three parole board members this is at charlie's end yeah three parole board men two older gentlemen and one young lady the young lady uh commanded the presence um domineering is too strong but she carried herself well there was something about her charlie was there maybe four or five officers in the room um how the pro parole board or this parole board operated obviously people would come in uh witnesses uh charlie's offender manager charlie's personal officer uh, the prison psychologist and other people yeah um at my friend's marie's end the lovely marie so there's about three rows of chairs no there was three rows of chairs not about about 45 places at the back of the court she was seated there being deaf the proceedings started and she couldn't hear anything she asked the court ushers if she might move to the front at the front was the press there was two big tvs press were in front of the tvs then the public behind them they obliged and she was sat down next to press members so now you've got an idea of the scene so day one day one yeah charlie salvador also known as charlie bronson's parole hearing it didn't go well for charlie she said questions were repeated she believes it was done purposefully to get an unbiased sort of reply to them like are you having a good day charlie yes i'm having a good day are you having a bad day charlie no i'm all right thank you i'm having a good day that sort of thing but obviously it gets more complicated day one was the prison psychologist now the prison psychologist from the off i've met prison psychologists and i will say this for me a lot of people civilians professionals within the prison service um they they become part of that system i.e if you cut them down the middle of their torso they'd have hmps hm prison service and majesty's prison service running through them for my friend marie the psychologist was very biased um the outcome of the psychologist the prison psychologist bit was she wanted him to stay in and she wanted the prison service to do work with him this is a guy who has probably done 50 years inside he's 70 he's getting on now what work would you do with someone yeah he spent most of that time in solitary confinement isolated it was actually mentioned or somebody mentioned him actually being in a parole room with 10 people was probably the most people he has associated with since being locked up not forgetting he has been a difficult prisoner yeah so people might say to me when i said release him how's he going to manage if he's only ever been with them 10 people so the reason i would release him to his family is because no one who spent that length of time in prison is going to know how to manage on the out they're going to need support and help yeah but his family are the people who could deliver that what are you going to do with him in prison for me somewhere somebody probably hopes that he stays in prison he don't get released and he dies in prison because you're not going to do anything with him how what what exactly would you do with someone so that was a prison psychologist obviously there's a lot of questions you know reports they are questioned by the parole board these people they are challenged on their integrity they're challenged on their reasoning she was quite impressed with the parole board the two older gentlemen seemed very fair and they were sitting back taking things on board she said something that was very distracting it's going to be a longer one this guys but it is a great insight something that was very distracting 
was the amount of laptops in the room, people on laptops. You know, for me, there's no need for that. If you know what you're talking about, you don't need no laptop. Anyway, more to the point. She said the young lady asked a lot of questions as well. And they were asked in a sort of semi-aggressive manner. The reason she said it wasn't a good day for Charlie is because he lost his rag a few times. Yeah, the sort of things they were bringing up, the questions they were asking. But you know, losing your rag doesn't mean you shouldn't be getting out of prison. You know, just to put a little twist on this, because I've had a lot of messages for people, and I spoke to people who've been in the prison service a long time, and don't with Charles Bronson, the prison service, and he talked about this during the 70s and 80s, was fucking brutal, fucking brutal. Yeah? A lot of violence, a lot of racism towards prisoners' ethnic background, beatings, people got beat. Yeah? Not everyone's a Charlie Bronson can fight back, and he'll have had beating after beating after beating. Something she said was deeply disturbing, and she said because she was placed at the front of the courtroom, you know, she couldn't she couldn't stop herself in an emotional outburst and she found herself crying. But there was nobody to see her crying. So she managed to box that off, because that's what people with trauma do in life. You know, they have an outpouring of emotion. He described being naked in a body belt, in a cell, with a broken nose, and, you know, other injuries, left shivering cold on the floor. Again, yeah, Charlie has assaulted people, he's taken hostages. The art teacher at Hull, where he got lifed off, he said he did regret that incident. The prison governor he took hostage, he said, no, he didn't. The governor was a bastard. He was a horrible bastard, I don't regret that. So he was, for her, he was very honest in some of the things he said. Outpouring of emotion. I did actually make a few notes for this because her insight was amazing. And I didn't want to forget things. We'll come to Wednesday in a minute. Wednesday was his psychologist, shall we call her, yeah? And again, she will be questioned about things. So a couple of things here, I've set the scene. Okay, a couple of things that were brought up in order, she believes, to be used against Charlie. Somebody, um, Charlie used a few choice words describing him, sent him a doll with a cannabis plant in it, a small doll or effigy, and it had some cannabis in it, a cannabis plant, whatever that was. So that was brought up. Somebody said, you know, you were having drugs sent in. He explained he was totally and always had been anti-drugs. If some numpty was gonna send him drugs, then he couldn't do anything about that. If the prison service, you know, allowed them drugs to get through to him in a doll, an effigy or whatever, then that wasn't his fault. Something else that was brought up. <laughs> Again, th there is a sad tone to this, but I think you'll see where we're going and how my friend described it was used. Talked about him getting his meat and two veg out. Yeah, his willy, his dick, his tail, his knob, whatever you want to call it. And it's taken out of context. For her, the way it was used, because he did take it out, his dick, willy, knob, whatever. It was used out of context, suggesting he was a nonce, a sex offender, or there was something along them lines going on. He pointed out that he got his dick, willy, knob out to his girlfriend at the time, and nobody else, it was for her, yeah? So then someone pipes up, well, where is she now? Why is she not here? Why is she not a witness for you? Charlie very bluntly said she's dead. Yeah, she was my girlfriend then. She later became a wife and she's died. She's dead. Yeah, end of. He was very blunt about it, which kind of silenced the person that brought up the sex offender type issue or in insinuation. So we'll go to Wednesday. His psychologist, one of the first things she got challenged on, let's just watch the boy a little, you that uh, are fans. She got challenged on his name, Salvador Dali. 
yeah it's reportedly changed his name to salvador not salvador yeah salvador charles salvador because of charles salvador Dali. this was then you know questioned charlie himself says <laughs> all right sit down go on then good lad charlie himself said he changed his name to salvador because it means man of peace man of peace and she sort of said what like charles, charles i mean salvador Dali. sorry i'm getting a bit confused there but i'm wanting to portray it the point is it's to discredit people they were trying to discredit her saying you said salvador Dali." That's why he changed his name. He says, man of peace. You know, he's full of shit. Anyway, she conducted herself very well. Incidentally, on Wednesday, the young woman on the parole board, she was reported as coming back with a different line of questioning. Almost like I said this, not my friend, but she agreed, good cop, bad cop. You know, one of them's like, coming at you like this, and the other's angry and... Yeah, so they're trying to catch you out. They're trying to get him for being drugs. They're trying to get him for being a non-sex offender or whatever. All these things are brought up. For me, a parole hearing bringing up about a little doll, an effigy, is pathetic and fucking embarrassing. Anyway, I've already said my friend was sat next to the press at the front. So she had a conversation with the press. Um, again, to give some context, I believe she said, Channel 5... The guy seemed really decent, or woman, I'm not sure which it was, and gave a very good, well, he was a reasonable man. There was no bias there. She spoke to someone from the <coughs> BBC, no shit, who, when she asked about Charlie Bronson and whether he should get out, almost bit her face off. Slavering, spitting in her face, she said. She said, she said to this guy, Listen, I'm just having my lunch, you know, um, I didn't mean to offend you, perhaps we can have this conversation later. And he says, yeah, no problem, he changed like that. The press were very biased, other than Channel 5, and she mentioned one other, I can't remember who, who gave a good account of themselves. So, bias reporting, people trying to catch him out for what is pathetic, embarrassing things for me. Um, so now let's get to the nitty gritty. For me, giving you my opinion, if they're gonna let him out, he needs to go to his family with whatever support is needed, whatever terms and conditions, tagged, house curfew, whatever. Yeah, that's what they need to do with him. Um, before I give her view, it's worth mentioning art. He talked about his art. Um, pictures for charity he presented three pictures she said she would love to see them to the parole board three pictures presented to the parole board whether anyone gets to see him ever saying this is me you know this is Charlie Bronson this is Charles Salvador he did talk about the dark times and we have to remember again the prison service was brutal anyone who can't accept that you know there's plenty of people out there who lived through that and they've told me it was brutal would they come on camera would they fuck yeah there's some really amazing people I worked for with who have retired, yeah? In the last 15 years, they tell me stories and ask me not to repeat and they're fearful of a backlash 15 years after retiring from the service. Brutal, brutal regime in prison, yeah? So he suffered that. You know, we have to take some responsibility for some of the people we create within the prison system. I saw some of that dark times, people from them dark times. Come on then, Stevie. Come on. There were some unpleasant people. There were also lads and lasses who come from them times who might not have been the most professional officers with integrity during them times, but changed, changed with a regime. Now I'm not the person to say if someone spent their first 10 years in the 80s beating the shit out of prisoners and then spent another 20 years doing some good stuff, whether they're forgiven or whatever. But let me tell you now, if all the good people in the prison service who were afraid 
to stand up and be counted and I've been there and it's not nice if they all left it would have been a truly horrible place because I met hundreds of amazing people lads and lasses who did a fantastic job lads and lasses who won't beat people won't bully people would do the best people had empathy yeah but he doesn't hide the fact that it was a brutal system so her thoughts the chances of him stopping where he is now in the high security estate or at that particular prison Woodhill I believe is at a small or small to medium chance of him stopping there there was calls for him to be moved the parole board I believe were calling for him to be moved the parole board have no say where somebody goes keeping him within the high security estate in segregation solitary type conditions is going to do nothing I don't believe you could do anything with him now I perhaps should have mentioned this at the beginning the things she did observe in fact I'm gonna leave that I'm gonna finish off now and you'll have already heard my thoughts on that okay slightly longer content today I've got a cracking interview I will be posting tomorrow there will be the second part of the interview Wednesday and Monday mental health Mondays I'm gonna start doing lives very soon I'm gonna have guests I'm going to talk all things mental health, prison, because they run round in hand, the criminal justice system and the like, it just creates problems. Stephen? Alright then kid, thanks for coming, I'll see you there.